Good evening. Welcome, everyone, to tonight's edition of Poem Jam, our monthly poetry reading, second Thursday of each month. I'm John Smalley, a librarian with the General Collections and Humanities Center of the main library, where most of the poetry collection also resides. Uh, while we're waiting for one or two more people to join us, I want to uh, start by acknowledging our community. On behalf of the Public Library, we welcome you to the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatushaloni, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards, and in accordance with their tradition, the Ramatushaloni have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as caretakers of this place. As guests, we who reside in their traditional territory recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush Ohlone, and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. As I mentioned, uh, this is an ongoing poetry series. We hope you will come back next month. If you want to know more about the poetry events and other literary events, there are flyers on the table over there. You could also pick up a, a monthly newsletter or visit our website, sfpl.org, and go to the events calendar there. Please also help yourself to coffee and cookies. And tonight only, there is a limited edition of a new Poem Jam pin. If you don't see them on the table, talk to Doug. He's in the audience. And that ends my announcements. Without further ado, let me introduce the host of today's show, Kim Shuck. Please give a warm welcome to Kim Shuck. <laughs> folks. I'd also like to thank whatever genus loci is responsible for the fact that a kayak was not necessary today because the weather, for those who aren't aware and are watching this later on a video, has been exciting in all kinds of ways. So um, we're here today to celebrate a book that I really believe in called Beat Not Beat. Uh, it was the brainchild of Rich Ferguson, and uh, it's a really spectacular collection. Every time I go through it, I find new things that I think are pretty exciting. And uh, so this is the book. I'm going to read my poem, and then I'm going to grab some people up. I, I, I was one of the co-editors. There's another co-editor here tonight. Uh, changing light and crows. Today, we are the streaked and fallen leaves in the red light of bookstore and bar, in the tumble of roadworks and at least one tree full of crows and five-fingered leaves, the stroking wind and the purposeful fog. In these moments before the walk down a main street, through an idea of history that is stretched until smooth, drawn between at least two people, but usually more. This is a song to this dangerous need to rewrite, and we are the leaves. We blow and skitter and know a different truth. So. <clears throat> the collection itself actually has uh, it's a pretty good cross-section of um, poets from different times. We don't really think about poetic lineages as much in the United States as they do elsewhere, but this definitely, you can draw some lines between styles from era to era in this, and it's, it's well worth having. Our first reader tonight is going to be Judy Bernard, who is Remarkable in a lot of ways, um, but it's also a really spectacular poet. So please welcome Judy to the microphone. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be included in this anthology. I'm just delighted with the result and delighted to be among such august company. Um, I was thinking about beat 
the beat generation and what it means to be beat or not beat. And I didn't come to any real conclusions. <laughs> it's, a wide, it's a wide field. But um, I thought about, as I, I, I looked in this old uh, poetry book of mine, which actually includes the poem that's in the anthology, um, I thought a lot about, you know, there, have always, there has always been a counterculture. But somehow with the beats, it was publicized. It was lionized or demonized. And um, so anyway, this is uh, what I came up with. This book is actually in three parts. And I think it, this book was dated, even when I wrote it. <laughs> because, <laughs> um, the first part is my experiences with a, a construction company where I worked. And I, uh, as I reread the poems, I thought about the fact of the working class, which is a disappearing class in the United States now. Uh, one is either uh, rich or poor these days, it seems. So uh, these are a couple of poems about the working class. It also refers to immigrants, uh, because the people that I worked with in the, in the construction company were, were immigrants from Mexico and Central America. This is Victor and Adolfo. If I wrote down everything that comes to mind when Victor and Adolfo returned to the shop to pick up a bag of cement or a can of paint, why, a hundred pages wouldn't be enough. Skip the cliches, how can I, when these guys appear to me to revel in moldy stereotypes and to want to wear their ethnicity like a raincoat in a downpour? Adolfo drives into the parking lot and screeches to a halt. He always drives, the car is his. Is it my fault he screeches to a halt? I swear that's what he does. He says something, and Victor laughs. Adolfo drives, speaks. Victor rides shotgun, laughs. Adolfo, ironic, short, muscular. Victor, sincere, tall, bony. The way I remembered which one was which at first, the wrong one was Sancho Panza. The 16-year-old Toyota Corolla isn't white. It's pearl immaculate. The color decal in the back window is what? The Virgen de Guadalupe, herself immaculate. Irony and sincerity get out of the car like they own the world. Who do they think is watching? The boss and I are watching. He says, here come your boyfriends. I could almost be their grandmother. <laughs> I read about this somewhere. Mexicans love masks, wrestlers, revolutionaries. Victor and Adolfo don't have to pull anything over their heads. An absolute lack of guile is not possible, must be a pose. And however convincing, an ironic distance can't be maintained in public and in private forever, must be discarded among friends and family, or even just to get laid. So these two come to work every day, five, six, sometimes seven days a week. They work, don't mind if you see them sweat, but they don't want you to see how they feel about it. The big diamond stud Adolfo wears in his ear catches the light. Its glint punctuates his impassive face. He mimes shutting the car door, demonstrating to Victor how he wants him to exit. Victor laughs. I wonder about their lives, where they go after work, if they have wives, girlfriends, mothers who miss them. What do they hope to gain from this endless, heavy labor? I wonder all of the above and more. And you see, I haven't even gotten them out of the parking lot. <laughs> Thank you.
This is called work clothes. I saw these words in a shop window on Mission Street. Uniformes para todo tipo de trabajo. I asked myself, are there uniforms for every kind of work? I studied the drug dealers and their clientele hanging out at McDonald's. There was something uniform about their grimy t-shirts and faded jeans. But you can't get that look from a store, I thought. I walked behind some young mothers with their mothers and babies in strollers. The young mothers wore tight pants and high heels. The old mothers wore flower prints and carried plastic bags. The babies wore baby clothes and waved their little arms in the air. Wives, mothers, grandmothers, daughters, granddaughters, lovers, these women have too many jobs for one uniform, I thought. I stopped in a cafe for a cup of coffee. I remembered old time waitresses in pastel uniforms with lace hankies in their pockets. Here, the barista wore baggy pants cut off below the knee and a stained wife beater. He had plugs in his ears and a ring in his nose, tattoos all over his body. You can't fool me. I know those tattoos are some kind of uniform. <laughs> This book seemed to me, as I was rereading it, to be very much about finding voice, finding a way of communicating. And I came across this poem. Um, this is kind of the uh, social justice part of the book, where we wrote about, um, uh, many of us did. Um, I don't know if you remember Muhammad al Jami. He was the Qatari poet who was uh, um, uh, imprisoned for speaking against the regime, and he became a cause celeb. With writers, uh, Penn took him up, and writers all around the world uh, agitated for his release, which he finally was released after some years. Anyway, this is called We Will Be Your Voice for Muhammad al -Ajami. The darkness has not made you invisible and the rhythm of your breath will not be muffled by the walls that surround you. The meaning of your song is not lost to us, and the sound of your words will not be stifled by the evil of your imprisonment. We will be your voice. We will count the days and the hours of your solitude, and we will tally the cost of your poems that the jailers have denied us. We will grasp our pens with renewed strength and we will expose tyranny and praise justice wherever we find it. We will be your voice. Your punishment is our punishment and your memory our memory. We will travel with you to the limits of our imaginations. We will find a new country where we can say what must be said and we will celebrate the scent of jasmine and the triumph of spring. We will be your voice. And um, this one seemed to me particularly out of time, I think because of my growing up in the 60s and early 70s, um, you know, Vietnam was our war, and I thought that maybe this anti-war poem was a bit dated, but I hope you find something here. This is called, What to Do About the Sorrows of War. Watch an anti-war movie, any anti-war movie. Watch Platoon or The Hurt Locker. Look at photographs of, from World War II. Don't look at the raising of the flag on Iwo Jima. Look at pictures of Buchenwald. Listen to someone who is in Korea. Don't listen to Hawkeye Pierce or Corporal Klinger. Listen to someone who was there. 
Stare at news footage from Vietnam. Stare at videos of naked, screaming children. Think about monks setting themselves on fire. Don't think about peaceful, stoned hippies. Think about crippled, broken men unable to speak out loud, still using the hand signals they use to communicate with each other on combat missions in the jungle. See if you can find a homeless, drug-addicted veteran who hasn't pawned his purple heart. See if you can find a veteran who will say, the Veterans Administration did right by me. They kept every promise they made. See if you can find anyone who was there who will say, I'm sure Agent Orange didn't harm our troops. It's all in their imaginations. Picture a middle-aged Latina, a single mother, her only son flies supplies into combat zones in Iraq. Picture her sleeping with her cell phone on her pillow, every day more terrified than the last. Picture him wondering why, if he's going to get killed, he didn't just join a gang, make some money, take care of his sisters before he died. Picture him wondering where all the rich boys are. Learn geography. Find out what countries border Afghanistan. Learn to spell. Find out about post-traumatic stress disorder. Learn the cures for insomnia. Look into the use of substandard equipment. Look into the reasons why so many soldiers come home without limbs. Look into the bank accounts of the profiteers. Look into the crimes perpetrated on native people. Imagine someone shooting at you. This is not a dream. This is not a movie about cowboys and Indians. And anyway, who are the cowboys? Who are the Indians? Imagine the guy next to you is suddenly dead. What will you tell his parents? What will you tell his wife? What will you tell yourself about why he died? Here is what you can do about the sorrows of war. Wring your hands until your skin comes off. Weep until your eyes are dry. Break into loud sobs. Wail and scream until they put you away. Tear out clumps of your hair. Throw your hair into the fire. Dig your fingernails into the palms of your hands until blood appears. Rub the blood on your face. Plead with them to stop fighting. Throw your body between the combatants and beg them to stop, stop, stop. And finally, the poem from the uh, wonderful anthology. I think this about sums it up. Will the poets keep quiet? No, they will not. They will not linger in the gloaming. They will not idle in the daybreak. They will not drowse at noon. The poets will speak. They will whisper to their lovers. They will talk among themselves. They will relate and orate and berate. They will traverse to converse and scramble to gabble. They will stop and chat about this and that. They will discuss what is old hat. They will rhyme and keep time. The poets will speak. They will scurry to the dais. They will lean upon the lectern. They will hold forth in the hall. They will hit and miss and flail and fail. They will proclaim and declaim and defame and inflame. The poets will pounce to pronounce. They will praise and they will amaze and they will search their souls for days. The poets will not keep quiet. The poets will speak. Thank you. And as the, the tech <laughs> gets rearranged, um, our next poet is Paul Corman Roberts, who is, I, I've introduced him far too many times as basically my good right hand for a lot of projects. But to be honest, um, there will come a moment, I'm fairly sure, where my literary career um, will 
basically be a tricky trivia question about his. So if you will please welcome Paul to the microphone. A little bit, a little bit. Um, it is an honor and a privilege to be in, in Beat Not Beat, to have my work alongside people that I, oh, hi, Carolyn. <laughs> um, along people that I grew up reading, wanting to be like, wanting to emulate, people whose lives I thought I wanted to have until I got to know them and realized, oh, maybe I'm glad I, maybe, maybe I be careful what you wish for. Um, there's been a lot of going around about poetry being dead. So again, it seems like it comes around every other year. So I had to take it on. This is why poetry is dead. Because poetry won't make you rich. There are no poetry billionaires. There are no poetry millionaires. There are no poetry thousandaires. There are no poetry agents. There are no poetry managers. Poetry managers are even more broke than poets. Poetry doesn't have a retirement plan. Poetry don't make moves. Poetry don't own a yacht. Poetry don't get down with yacht rock. Poetry costs more than it makes. Poetry eats more than it works. Poetry's application with a country club always gets tossed. Poetry is insolvent. Poetry is bankrupt. Poetry isn't listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Poetry has no hedge fund. Poetry chooses the path of most resistance. Every hostile takeover of poetry has failed. The holy ghost of the poet Rupi Kaur might have been compels you. How is poetry even alive? What does it mean to be alive? What does it mean to be dead? Check. Poetry is viral. Poetry has no cure. You can't stop talking about how it's dead. Checkmate. You're dead. You're dead. You're dead. And out of this world. Just kidding, that last part's not really there. That's... This is called Howard Johnson's End. <laughs> the counter by default becomes the longest bar in this dying train depot town. The middle of the floor is one of those circular stone fire pits where a fake fire would warm a fake hearth, an oasis among the garish carpeting. You can visualize the ghosts of polyester couples and corduroy lounging around the stone circle like ancient Pueblo people used to, but with foo-foo cocktails. Inside the fire pit, a guy on a stool with a cowboy hat, faux sequin vest punching buttons on an outdated looping machine, old pop country heartbreak electronica beats. He straps an acoustic 12-string around his neck and croons like Glenn Campbell. I hear there are louder, brighter nightclubs in nearby towns, Larger towns, almost small cities. I'm not interested in those places. Desperate people don't go to those places. I'm interested in the people who would rather come here because they used to come here before on cold winter nights when this used to be a Hojo's. <laughs> a little timeliness. This is an older poem I'm bringing back for the, for the moisture from, from the sky. This is called The Ragged There. All that ripples in this latest version of the world are sand dunes, parched, cracked, rippling from lack. H celebrates with abandon, with anticipation of inundation. Already more hyper aware of the importance of water relative to my awareness when I was her age. She watches me go outside and stand in it for a while, watches me lift my face to it for a while. I motion for her to join me, and she, and she does so, if somewhat self-conscious, the smile of her mouth, perfect in its honesty. You know, I've had my share of this. My fear is that in the day not far away, she will need to record these moments as much for herself and not merely her children. These are all pretty new poems. This is a very new poem. Goya was a family man. Presiding over their children's funerals, monstrosity chases all the quiet air from the chapel. 
nothing but sobs, choking, and sobs. A mother teaches her babies how to perform tricks on the shoulders of high waves. The big rig driver gets life as if he acted alone. Anyone who knew anything long ago melted into liquid air, or Oregon, or Arizona, or Ogden, always deeper into the always heart of savagery. Saturn still buried, always deep in our DNA. Two more poems. Uh, I have a new, I, I just self-published a book. I've never really self-published a book before. And I had the chutzpah to actually put my face on the damn thing. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's an old picture, but it was a, it was a, a cartoonist. Like, it just out of the three years ago, it was all like, hey, man, let's do a comic book. Uh, like a poetry comic book? Okay, I'm, I'm into it. So we have a, I have a poetry comic book. Unfortunately, I only have one copy for sale tonight. But if anyone's interested, uh, I'm going to read this short piece from it called Clash of Civilizations. If I could read my own font. Tonight, there are artists and activists putting their bodies on the line on the borders in Arizona and California and at the detention centers in Texas and New Jersey and Florida. And tonight, as I come home from a meeting with the resistance, there are nine squad cars and a chopper dispatched out to the Surfside Palms apartment complex. Something about youth gathering on the beach the night after Independence Day, scattered into the residential enclave, for fanning out from the seek and detain. Tonight, my little neighborhood has become the center of the island of lost adults. <clears throat> Tonight, there are artists and activists trying to find something to hold the children for the, trying to find something for the children to hold on to besides the bars of cages. Tonight grows thick with a marine layer, thick with tactical and medical duffels, thick with canines and extra units, thick with chatter of a sucker punch and an activated taser, a cry of pain somewhere out there on Kitty Hawk Avenue. You can't tell me there isn't a clash of civilizations happening out there on the borders, at the detention centers, and on Kitty Hawk Road on Independence Weekend on the island of lost and found adults. And finally, I will close with the piece from the um, from Beat Not Beat, uh, and this is, and this is, and this is, this is one of the most beat things I've ever written. I gotta say. The explanation of pretty much everything. And still, I can't help but think you contain not multitudes, nor even all worlds, but all the galaxies, all the universes, and all the ultra universi. You manifest the spiral, not a cycle, but a vector, an echo in every medium we have ever encountered. This is not motion so much as frequency, bits and pieces of you cramming yourself out of and into the perceptible there and there between the scylla of your wavelengths and the charybdis of your antimatter. This is, the, this is the crux where all the philosophers and shamans and alchemists and visionaries and poets rend their hearts and dash their minds against the impossibly dense contradiction of existence. And it can't be easy cycling in and out of all of these dimensions relative to your journey. But I want to be among the first from my dank cubbyhole to thank you all for the hard work you are forever birthing. These armadas of Prince Caspians forever sailing towards the gravitational barriers where oceans of poppies and posies inevitably smother our brave lonely vessels in pollen and nectar never to return. Yet around and around we continue. Little foundations of you with whom I surely share bits of with Hypatia, with Krishna, Buddha, ah, Christ. But also, the first post them primate to discover the practical value of murder. It is you whom all of us share. So once more now, your long night's journey into day, preoccupied, and you remain eddying in the fringe cul-de-sacs on the edge of town, on the perimeter of a campfire, where cold and dark things reflect just enough candescent light to keep you hypnotized, horrified, and everything between just long enough to keep the rest of us hanging around, which goes a long way towards understanding the explanation of pretty much everything. Thank you. Thank you guys. Hey. What some of you may not have noticed is that in this slightly unlit area over here, there's a table. 
and there are books on it. And these books are by Julie Rogers, who is remarkable, whose work I was introduced to by Bill Vartna, who is also remarkable. And uh, we are incredibly fortunate to have her coming up to this microphone right now. So please welcome Julie Rogers to the mic. I am really happy to be here, and I was thinking of my poem in Beat Not Beat like a leaf on a great tree. It's such an awesome book. And when I looked through it, I was astonished because there are all the <laughs> great writers that I love, you know? So thank you so much. I'm gonna start with the poem that's in this wonderful tome which I never expected to be published at all, but I sent it to S.A. Griffin, and he took it. <laughs> this is called Tendencies. Life drives me crazy. I swear, this is not my car. I don't remember buying it. I can't afford to rent it. I don't recall parking here. There's never enough insurance. I wouldn't shop here if someone had warned me. Who knew? Right here, this gets real existential, like I don't understand the stricken world, so sad and beautiful. All I know is somehow I stopped here and choose to stay to continue the tradition. I tell myself, remember to stand up. Then I look to see if I'm here with the key. Then it all comes back. Turns out I do drive. I even have a license. I drive good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is a book that came out right when COVID started, so it sat in a box at the bottom of the stairs for two and a half years. It's called Life on Earth. It's a little chapbook. <laughs> and so I'll just read a few. These are fairly short. And I don't think I need to say much. I think they're self-explanatory. This is called The Country as a Toilet. Politics, tissue on a bathroom floor used and tossed, the intended function fleeting as a flush. Not to insult, but the pipes are clogged, the deodorizer's spent. No claims to deciphering the news or how to fix the way it is continually running on, but here I am in the sewer system with the classes sinking into lower economics in the swirl of the drain that starts in a full tank and fills to empty us. <laughs> Thank you. This is, uh, I wrote this a couple years ago for some folks that were living at the freeway off ramp that I often go by. It's called Barely in the Race. Might seem easy to sit there on a corner with a sign hand printed Hungary, more legible than a doctor's scrawled script for meds. Maybe forgot to take them, or just can't afford it, or that's not what's needed. It's about food, water, shelter, just begging day and night, weathered face facing traffic, sometimes with a dog, or a bottle, or a kid, or reading a book, waiting with no room for anything else, just your life all packed up beside you, in a shopping cart, or just a bundle crouching down on the curb at the starting gate of the finish line. Thank you. This poem is from um, an unpublished manuscript that I've been writing for 39 years. <laughs> it's all the poems I've written for my daughter, Sangay. 
And so this was written well after she moved out of the house. But, you know, you just miss them. And this is for all the moms. It's called Hen House. The mother is never done. Her hands work her heart, Plato shapes. The mold cuts her to size. She looks in the mirror of her child's eyes and stares back. She holds a bottle, a receiver, a broom, remembers not knowing what to do, but she never stops talking. Her voice, an alarm clock, bullhorn, lullaby, crackling long distance, muttering under her breath, quick prayers, hopes like great clouds on the horizon. She tells herself to let go. All birds fly. She cleans and cleans the nest, its emptiness, its clutter of songs. She learns to sing a new tune. She's off key, but carries on late at night when the other hens are quiet. Thank you. Oh, here's a quick little poem about what some of us are enduring daily. It's called Mug Shot. Turning gray is just another disguise. Wrinkles thicker than thieves with heavy bags under eyes blurring, distances farther off. Whenever I look up close, that face in the photo is someone else, certainly not me. Mine got lost in the mirror ages ago. Went off with that blonde, remember her? Didn't stay long, though I thought she'd never leave. Took what I had and left me with this. <laughs> It's so good to hear laughter about that. <laughs> I just have one more. This is from a book called House of the Unexpected that was published in 2012. 10 years ago seems like 100 years ago, doesn't it? Um, during COVID, which is continuing, by the way, it was really a hard time for everyone, and it was hard for me, and I had to have many, many come to Jesus periods. <laughs> Happened all the time, in fact. <laughs> so this is a poem written a long time ago, but it still really touches on some of the things that were going on in my mind, and it goes way beyond my mind. It's one of those poems where you sit down and it just floods out. I don't know where it came from. It's called Revelation. I am woman, man, child. I am the peak, the cave, darkness, brilliance. I am that which is invisible without substance, a vision of nameless form present in the body, in the senses, an atmosphere of bliss and profusion. I am the empty voice of rumors that tell everything, revealer of secrets and lies, the throbbing pulse of a hidden life spent in full view. You cannot control me. I am assertion, withdrawal, giving, taking, force of energy and creator of frenzy. I am in your arms, under your tongue, between your legs, in your heart so firmly that your life is your own, but your eventual surrender is certain. I am your mother, your lover, your enemy, your idea of yourself undone, made more beautiful, more real, more of an illusion. I am not a thought, a phantom, a mask, a mirage. I am what you have always wanted, what you fear, what you don't understand, what you have inside you like a world you cannot touch but feel constantly. I am your savior, betrayer, ally, spy, guru, 
Slayer, there is nothing I do not know about you. My throne is firm on your crown, on your face, your penis, your lotus. I live inside you, blood, bones, whirling atoms, filling the space of your dissolution. Do not doubt my expanse. Do not distrust the emptiness of my presence. You speak of me as a mystery, but I have taken you everywhere. I am prayer, curse, vow, the promise of experience. I steal your ideas and spin them off into the world without asking, do you know me? Sky dancer, mirror, a blinding ray of heat. I have transcended belief. I am simple as faith. Only the unknown can live beyond me, and once made up, you will think I am your mind. Where nothing is lost, nothing is found. Trust this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Five bucks. I can never do that for myself, so I'm yeah. doing it for you. <laughs> Our next reader is uh, another one of the co-editors of this uh, incredible collaborative piece of work, S.A. Griffin, who delightfully showed up tonight. <laughs> Wonderful surprises. Uh, Paul knows I always say the right people show up at the reading both to listen to it and to read at it. Please welcome S.A. to our yeah. microphone. And you can go with all the one. I don't know if that's going to be. Thank you. I know this is coming up to the stage, so I'm bringing it up for a reason. As my valet. Um, I'm Mr. California. I grew up in the East Bay, primarily in Richmond. Grew up in the, on South 26th Street most of, most of the time. Oh, that's got a little thing happening. Um, in the Easter, Easter Hill Projects there. And Lisa Maria Presley just died. And uh, one of the people that lifted me up in the beautiful Fox Theater on McDonald Avenue, which is no longer there, it uh, passed away in 1967. I would go there for 35 cents, see two movies, cartoons, whatever, you know what I mean? Popcorn and nickel, et cetera, et cetera. And I would go see every fucking Elvis Presley movie that ever came out and every Jerry Lewis movie. That's how fucked up and confused I am. <laughs> That's for Elvis and Lisa Marie. Thank you very much. And uh, it is, thank you for inserting me. Thank you very much. I'm so pleased to meet you finally because you've been a ghost in the machine for me. We've never spoken, we've never met, so I looked at videos of you, I read your bios, read your poetry, so it's wonderful to finally meet you. Yes, that's the internet, baby, that's it. <laughs> I do util utilize the internet, so no batteries needed. <laughs> so anyhow, I'm honored to be here with you. Thank you, Kim, and th thank you for your work on this book. This motherfucking book is a great doorstop. <laughs> it will stop you at your door. No, it's, uh, and uh, there's no such thing as an outdated war poem. It's impossible. Another great anti-war movie, Pan's Labyrinth, one of the greatest of all time. Um, and I uh, served during that period of time because I was fantasizing about how, how to kill my stepfather. And I had no idea what the real world was like, although I was fairly streetwise, and I'm the oldest of six. And, uh, and I found out by the time I was out of basic training, I, got, I really fucked myself good this time. Did my four years, got the hell out. Um, anyhow, I'm going to read a few poems from this. Um, and one of the cool things, uh, like people, um, some years ago when I toured with my poetry bomb, people would ask me, does poetry matter? Poetry is ubiquitous. It is elemental. Really, all religious text is what? What drives people nuts around the world and sends them forward? It's all religious text is poetry. Poetry is what really lifts you up and sends you into battle. So anyway, this first poem I'm going to read is um, by a guy named Alan J. Friedman, and we were discussing Ruth Weiss. Well, Alan 
um, was one of the first poets I encountered in Los Angeles. And, um, and he died a long time ago. And typical of people you meet in the poetry world, it's like you think you know them. Then they pass away and you go to the funeral and you find out this guy had a little money. He lived in an upper middle class uh, home. He was a chemistry teacher and a Boy Scout leader. I knew him as a wild man of poetry. His name was Alan J. Friedman. A meditation on the responsibility of the poet. Let us assume for just one moment that our poetry does matter, not in some aesthetic sense in which of course it does, like every other art, possess its proper form and substance, but as matter in the world, possessing weight and moment so that it does move, not merely to some pleasant or unpleasant action. Let us assume that we are poets, fellows of an ancient order, beneficial, dangerous, significant, that we possess our craft in measure, that our craft possesses us, that we must be responsible for every word we speak, and that our words retain their power even when the ink and paper have been lost. Let us assume all this for just one moment, then examine where and how we may be led in disposition of our power and the crafting of our poems. That's actually framed and on my wall, man. It really is. Um, why, I mean, seriously, like, you know, we talk about all the living and dead poets. When we speak their words, when we speak their names, they are alive. We carry them forward with us. I'm only here because of these people in this book, man. You know, um, anyhow. This is uh, by um, my old best friend who passed away some years ago. He, he um, was from L.A., but he went to SF State and got his master's degree in creative writing. Uh, one of his... Um, one of the things he spent his life doing, when I got all of this stuff after he passed away, Scott Wanberg, he died about almost 12 years ago now. And when he, I got his, finally got his books and all of his other possessions, the only books that were annotated were by William Carlos Williams. Because William Carlos Williams spent his life in search of the American idiom, and Scott was doing the exact same thing. And this, is, this poem kind of sums up Scott and his life's work as well. The dancer steps forward. The dancer stays home, digging in his earth looking for the bone that will sing to him. His friends have run off to Europe. They groan, pull their hair, wail. America is a paltry place for the imagination. They hit the walls, deny their past. They become good Europeans. The dancer shrugs in his New Jersey afternoon, begins to dance around the circumference of his native ground. I've got to learn the language, he says. I've got to follow through on the syntax. There is a music here. Don't be so quick to deny it. He steps out onto the American earth. People come to him, ask, do you know what they are doing across the sea? They are writing epics. They are tearing up the linear fabric. Let me do my digging, he says, and the music that is alive there begins to attach itself to his skin in that hard-working New Jersey afternoon. His patients come. His patients go. The good doctor knows there is a music here. One of his good friends, an old schoolboy pal, who will later do time for mixing aesthetics and politics, keeps haranguing him to come to Europe. I'm too busy digging, he says. There is a music here, I tell you, and my job is to find it, learn it, sing it. You can have your poets of Provence. You can have Confucius. I'm hunting a different game altogether. The sun grows hot. He begins to sweat there in the yard, digging. He takes a drink of water. We leave him at his work as night quietly shows up. Later, he steps onto the front porch. He will begin naming the new rhythm, the kind of rhythm that you recognize on the street, maybe. Not some secret arcane language, not some language you need a dictionary to understand, the kind of rhythm you can maybe figure out all by yourself as you roll it around in your mouth, as you begin to say it, and it begins to sing you. There is a music in the American idiom, he says, and wipes his face for the last time, and begins to think about going up to bed. Tomorrow is another song. Tomorrow will be other patients and words to discover and stories behind such words that illuminate. The game, after all, is one of discovery. The day you stop finding out things is the day you might as well turn yourself in for good. He slowly makes his way upstairs to his beloved Flossie. There is a music here. All you have to do is believe, and the rest is just some history of song and love. Woo! And these are all poems from the book. 
And I wish there were copies here so we could say buy it. Fuck yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read. I know. How would we look if we were doing things right? We wouldn't look like poets. <laughs> so all these books, all these poems are in the book. This is another one by another friend of mine. Uh, we were all the Karma Bums together, and Doug and I were the Lost Tribe and the Karma Bums together. We toured all over the country in Canada and smoked a lot of weed and had a good time. Did a lot of horrible things and wonderful things together. And this is also in the book. And then I'm going to read my short poem and I'm done. And thank you very much. I'm so honored to be here. And thank you for allowing me to come up. Apology to Greta Thunberg. You're right about that global warming, kid. We spent it. We drove it. We burned it. We fueled it. We rode it. And we didn't pay for it. Didn't think it was your future, too. We are your distinguished elders and came of age just before the peak of the wave, and we've surfed it to the shore, rolling in like pearls. We're the coolest. Didn't even work for it. It just got laid on us by the big living earth Gaia. Yes, she said, take my breast. And we took her blood, skin, and bones too. And our generation has enjoyed every possibility of living whatever we want. Wherever we choose to go, we are the party of freedom, meaning we partied with freedom. Now we're those hard-boiled eggs in the sunset. What do you want from us? Please deliver your rage to our chattering class. We are the tribe, the human tribe, and we welcome you to this fat ball planet where we're all born out of God's word. And when we get hungry, we go out on the crinkle, bulgy landscape and kill, kill, kill a big elephant to feed our tribe. Lots of meat, meat, meat. We eat, eat, eat. Then dance, pray, fuck. Then pray, fuck, dance. Afterwards, sleepity sleep. <laughs> then get up, have coffee, and make civilization. <laughs> Hammocks. Clay pots, sexy figurines of gods, Broadway plays. We create a world of light and dark. Sex, poetry, ocean-going plastic, capitalism, terrorism, religion. A house fantastic for us alone. Enough! We hungry again. Let's get another elephant. Or at least an In-N-Out burger. There's always more food, isn't there? Enough. It will all work out somehow. There will be a solution, somehow. But somehow, all that gets fuzzy when I try to think about it. I can't shoot that hoop of what to do. You say the only way is massive political action? No oil and eat nothing in plastic? Not a chance, even if everyone else does it. Who helps who control who? The earth is so stressed digesting us. Where can it shit except on you? So sorry, we knew but didn't know, and now you know but what to do. Also, there is no individual guilt. We're all absolved and complicit. All I ever did was drive my car and turn on the house lights and some air con. Me, such a tiny, ordinary consumer. In case the planet might shrug us off, you might consider the intrinsic death wish of the species and all that plastic in the guts of whales. We share the gifts. Climate change is a spiritual vaccination for those of us on the edge of the afterlife. The seas will rise. The continents fall. I thought I'd never live to see it happen. But I was wrong. And this is my contribution, and then I'm off, and thank you again very much. And then tomorrow night we'll be doing this again at the Beat Museum. <sighs> Print be small. I think I can read this, even though I gotta get my eyes checked again. Um, anyway, this is um, what the Ukrainians say to one another. And there is no real glory in war, but this is what they say to one another. Glory to the heroes for the people of Ukraine. Armed with an inspired lunacy, Putin is his own god, a nightmare for the modern era. As his terror campaign moves forward, the cult of war grows inside sovereign borders where all thoughts have been tried and found guilty. 
The carriers of plague with looks that kill have landed with their tortured reward, lost lives on parade collapse in despair as the people greet their makers of fear. Ritualized by the underwriters of conflict, the authorities of speech broadcast the intercepted letters of family and friends. History bends before the orthodoxy of bombs, flowers of evil, executing a catechism of calculated risk, blossom with a bright and terrible lust, a global light of muted lifetimes baked into the sacred tapestry of night. All the quiet stars falling like iron dice, tumbling into trap doors of agony and tears ever after. Thank you. Thank you. When I can, I make my life really easy. And there's nothing like booking a handful of people who are all so good, it doesn't matter what order you put them in, really. It's kind of nice. But I do have to say that our next poet um, also currently holds a title. <laughs> Kimi Sugioka is the current uh, Poet Laureate of Alameda. She is also, she's brilliant, brilliant, brilliant poet. And she's also rather strangely, because we don't see each other all that often, but every time I've won any important uh, award or gotten any accolade, really important one, two things have happened to me. A bird has pooed on my jacket. <laughs> <laughs> and within a day or two, I've seen Kimi. And if I were smarter, I'd just book her more often. <laughs> but I'm not. Anyway, please welcome Kimmy, who is a good friend, an excellent singer, and a brilliant poet. That's a lot to live up to. So... Yeah, I've been thinking about beat and not beat. What's beat? What's not beat? Um, I happen to be a graduate of the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics. So my teachers were people like Adam, like Allen Ginsberg, Robert Creeley, and Diane De Prima, and uh, whatever. Ann Waldman. Ann Waldman. Thank you, Ann Waldman. Yes, big time, Ann Waldman. So I think my writing is kind of equal parts. Um, I'm obviously influenced by them and also rebelling against them. <laughs> um, yeah. So, <clears throat> and I'm going to, uh, the set is really going to be sort of dedicated to this, <sighs> this man named Harry Smith, who was living at Naropa when I was there. He was old. It was only a couple years before he died. Um, but he was like a seminal figure in that world. But you may not know who he was, even though he was an ethnomusicologist, a filmmaker, a mystic. Uh, he, 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 he did a lot of things. Oh, and he did the um, Smithsonian Folkways uh, anthology of folk music. Yeah, which influenced a lot of people, apparently. Uh, so I'm told. So anyway, um, I'm going to start with my poem from the anthology. And then, oh, here it is. <laughs> my, I went to print my poems today, and my printer said, no. <laughs> so I'm just lucky I have this thing. Temporal Beatitudes. Howling is the one true song that eludes the fear of night and dogs. Wailing is the one true utterance of a divine sun that grapples with drips and drabs of futility. Umbrage skywalks between the branches of things that fall and things that grow, things that repeat and remember. Ever so lightly, ever so tightly, the reins are pulled and dropped. 
Sudden freedom, sudden fear of freedom, sudden sight, sudden retreat, a blessing and a privilege. The white light of summer sings arias to fall. We become moments, we become prayers, we become radiant and vital as thieves on the threshold of forgiveness. A traitor and a saint living in the same shell, blessing and cursing, tyranny and innocence. Oh, that the lake could drown these festering thoughts, that the bindings fray and break, and all words stretch into birdsong. We could go where the sand becomes soil and remember planting, remember the taste of corn melting between teeth and tongue, the taste of safety and home, where a mountain lullabies itself to sleep and marries the willow and the hemlock so all that is feral and fetal and indigent might finally billow in sweet relief. We may come and go with and without purpose, but the whole is a fragmented universe we carry like a dime in our pockets. Thank you. Um, and then I'm going to take a chance and read uh, a poem called The Chelsea Hotel from my first book. And uh, very old. <laughs> but it's really a story that Harry told me. So it's Harry's story. And I hope it's not too offensive because, you know, sometimes these guys were, they were, you know, uh, mm, <laughs> tr tr troublesome, yeah. Mm. So he lived in the Ch Chelsea Hotel for a while, and this is what he told me about that. Got a letter from an old friend of mine. For 12 years, we got drunk and broke a lot of bottles together. Penny's sort of an occult artist leader. I didn't hear from her for a long time because she was mad at me. You see, I had this friend, Joe, who accidentally murdered this other guy. I'm sure it was an accident. But this friend of mine, Dan Whistler, he came to my room at the Chelsea Hotel, grinning and yelling, Billy Maybeck's dead. But he wasn't the one who murdered him. You see, Dan it was Jenny Whistler's husband, and she was having an affair with Billy Maybeck. But it was my friend, Joe, who probably committed the murder. Someone else found the body all trussed up and told the hotel manager. He tried to make it look like it was natural death because he didn't want the police coming around. Well, this other guy was going to jail for three 30-year three sentences, so he said he'd take the rap. That was nice of him. He came from a whole family of criminals, you know, and the grandmother was the worst. She raised all these people who had a one-word vocabulary of, yeah. <laughs> anyway, he went to jail for it instead of Joe. Well, Penny had a big mouth, you know. It wasn't all just lipstick. She got to talking big, angry at my friend who may have committed the murder. I'm not really sure. She sent me this postcard one time, and I put a big X on the address and wrote, address unknown. And I never heard from her again, till today. She said she'd send me money if she knew the right address. She knows I always need money. So I called her up and she said she could hardly get out of bed anymore except occasionally when she uses her walker. Here I am calling her and she can't get out of bed and I can hardly walk. So Harry was indeed a trickster. Um, he was a trickster and but he, he, he taught us all things that we may or may have not, not have wanted to learn. <laughs> um, and I, I went to his memorial at the Bowery, at the, well, in New York. And um, some people got up and said, Harry was evil. He was rotten. And some people got up and said, Harry was amazing. He was a genius. And I thought it was just so interesting. I mean, like one person I, I met said, yeah, Harry, you know, I met him one time. He threw a can of Campbell's soup at me. Uh, you know? 
So he had very strong preferences and likes and dislikes. So I wrote this song after he died called Invisible Heroes and Sacred Clowns. You lived in a hotel of angels You lived on the streets with your dreams You lived in the town of the Golden Bough A cynical, sublime refugee High in the smoke of your cigarettes with your books and your branches and gourds. You furnished your home with a log and a stone, scattered maple leaves on the floor. You wore a stained seersucker jacket. Your pants were two sizes too huge. We offered you new clothes, but you said you preferred your simple suit of Dionysian hue. Now some may call you evil. Some may call you insane. But I will call you Raven. You stole a box of light and made day. And I asked you how you stopped drinking. You said Valium works pretty good for me. You try to kill the pain in your body and live off your mystic cosmogenies. And you kept squirrels and birds in your freezer And the varnished skeletons of mice I guess I was shy Cause I never asked why You kept their little souls on ice With your archaeologist scepter your foil and cardboard crown. You looked like a fool, but your words were divine. Just of a sacred clown. Divine just of a sacred clown. And you laughed when you spoke of your award. Said you crawled upon the stage on all fours. Bittersweet to receive such a commendation after food stamps and living door to door. And you used to speak with a squirrel who lived in a tree above your house. He had an old wife who rose early and a young wife who rose late and you laughed when they bickered in the boughs now some are invincible warriors commanding cheers from the crowd and some are invisible heroes just a few are celestial clowns. Last fall you were going to Egypt to make a film or dine with a sphinx. But you finally said if you weren't dead by then you'd probably end up in Boulder instead. And I told you I loved you in a letter Needing to say it just once But you carefully said You never read quite that far The letter was just too long Now 
some may call you evil and some may call you insane but I will call you Raven who stole a box of light and made day who stole a box of light and made day who stole a box of light and made day Thank you. I think I just conjured Harry. <laughs> um, I could stop or I could do one more song. One more song? One more song? Okay, so it's sort of apropos of nothing, but I like it. Um, and it is about a kind of crazy guy, too. It's called um, Gator Blues. I know a man down by the river He's got a gator smile No man down by the river And I've known him quite a while His teeth are bright as moonlight Sharp as a crocodile There's nothing quite like moonshine to make you take a man out of his skin. Nothing quite like moonshine to make you think you're gonna win. Moonshine will make a joker jump right out of the gin. There's nothing worth remembering Can't be as soon forgot Nothing worth regretting When what you took is what you've got It's just the same old coffee Brewing in the same old pot Got a monkey in the treetops Got a gator on the sand Got a gator on the doorstep And there's a monkey on the man There's no one left to talk to It's just me and the rabbit man Thank you, and I'm very honored to be in this book. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, San Francisco Public Library. Thank you, Kimi. And another hand for our features tonight. <laughs> Judy. Paul, Julie, S.A., Kimmy, thank you all for being here, audience. Um, also, thank you to the AV crew from the San Francisco Library. Yeah, hey. I'm not kidding. One of them's name is Mike, <laughs> which is how I remember that. <laughs> and Kenny and John and... Um, when we did a reading here one time and a group of younger people decided this was a poetry dungeon, I, I think that may make it sound a little too sexy. <laughs> but okay. 
anyway, thank you all for being here. Next month, we have uh, people reading from um, Shizui Siegel's uh, and recent anthology, Uncommon Ground. It should also be wonderful. So give yourselves a hand, buy books, and we'll see you next month. <laughs>